Good to be with you this morning. I want to thank Dave for leading us in that scripture reading of John chapter 17. That is where we will eventually go near the end of this lesson. I want to thank all of the men who have served this morning in various ways, as well as in, in speaking of the Lord's Supper and the things that are mentioned there. And so what we're going to be talking about today are things pertaining to our prayer, kind of a topic that we're going to be discussing specifically today will be what is our prayer, what is it that we pray for as a congregation, as a church, what is our prayer defined as. Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at what is it that we are pleading for. What are we pleading for? And we'll look at what the Bible teaches regarding that. And then we'll move into uh, the plan and some things associated with that, the plan. So this morning, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 10, and uh, we're going to look at that in just a moment, but... What I want to impress upon your minds this morning is, is that Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, that all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Earlier in the book of Matthew, he had taught in chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so as we talk about what is it that we pray for, if you were going to ask the average person that you would run into, what is it that the church where you are a member prays for? What is it that you all plead for? What does your plan look like? What does it revolve around? You might get many different answers to that question. And it would probably vary from person to person. And I'm asking you, what is it that we pray for? What is it that we are pleading for? What is it that we are planning? What is our plan or plans in the plural? And do these things match what the Bible itself teaches and governs us? For some people and for many churches, the prayer, the pleading, and the planning revolves around, at the center of that is numerical growth, that it is to attract people to this particular church. And if that alone is the uh, plan, if that alone is, 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 is the prayer, Frequently, what is seen then is that the rules of Christ are disregarded or that they are tossed out the window altogether, that the will of Christ no longer is in effect, that it doesn't govern what it is that we are to pray. It doesn't govern what it is that we are to plead for. It doesn't govern what we are is in our plans for him. And so I, I want to emphasize that we live in a world that both tempts us and at the same time it hates us. That there is an alluring quality of the world that draws us, pulls us, tempts us to do something. All along, the world itself despises us, hates us, can't stand our values. Why is it that we are attracted to that which will destroy us? Why is it at times that we are like that moth that's attracted to that flame? And what are we to do about it? You know, we are to trust in the rock while living in a world that is fluid in their values and fluid in their judgments. We are to be fixed on that which is eternal, that which is stable, that which is objective. And we should come to know that uh, 
the religion of Christ is going to be a religion that causes that type of hatred from the world. Several years ago, there was a movement in the church to kind of become ashamed of the Church of Christ, to become ashamed of the title, if you will, the name that is on the building, the Church of Christ meets here, or Church of Christ. And that's a biblical designation from Romans chapter 16, verse 16. It is not a proper name in the sense that my name is Stephen, but it is an identifier. It identifies who is here. And it is a church that is supposed to be of Christ that meets here. Because of the militancy of the past of preachers challenging denominational error and debates that were taken on and, 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 and you know, that darkness was, was exposed very directly, some people became more ashamed of that and they wanted to kind of let's take the name away from what it is that we're calling ourselves and, and kind of put it more into an obscure uh, title. And so we'll call ourselves Christians meet here or believers meet here or disciples meet here. Something like that to kind of obscure who it is that we really are. Now, most people in denominationalism Catholics and Protestants alike would readily identify themselves as being Christians or disciples or believers, and so they wouldn't see any distinguishing qualities here within this uh, church, within this congregation. What is the Lord's answer to living in a world that hates us and at the same time tempts us? The answer is to continue to trust in him. And when we look at his, if you will, birth, and, and, and what transpired shortly after when Joseph and Mary took the young babe to Jerusalem to do what was customary to him, we read in Luke, the second chapter, in uh, verse 27 of Simeon who came in by the spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said Lord now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for, the, uh, and, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Mary was going to see just how much the world can hate. At the same time, she will see those who will come to the Lord, and as we see there, will come to him to gain. Behold, the child is destined for the fall and rising of many. There will be the fall and the rising of many. She will see those portraits, if you will, of people that will come to the Lord to be saved. But at the same time, she will see people that will run to the Lord to crucify him, to kill him, to silence him to destroy him, and this will pierce her own soul also. But what stands out to me is that at the very beginning, when we read here about Jesus coming into the world, is that we read of conflict, conflict. 
Near the end of the New Testament, the book of Jude, in verse 15, we are ushered to when Jesus returns in the second coming of the judgment of the world, of which Jude writes to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Notice, ungodly sinners have what? Spoken or railed against him. This, of course, happened during the ministry of Jesus. It happened at the crucifixion of Jesus. But brethren, it has happened in every generation since Jesus ascended to heaven on high as well. And it happens today. For as people speak of the church, they are in essence speaking against or for Christ. And so we will be judged by the things that we say. We see here a judgment against ungodly sinners who have spoken against him in this godless way. In Acts chapter 28, we read of the church there as Paul was in house arrest and was still able to engage in Bible studies with others. We read in Acts, and again, you know, we're going to get to that Romans 10 here in just a moment. But in Acts chapter 28, verse 22, these Jews came to Paul and they said, We desire to hear from you what you think for concerning the sect. And they're talking about the church. Concerning the sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Because of the Lord's church stand for the truth, the Lord's church throughout time has been the brunt of persecution. It has been the brunt of jokes and mocking uh, ridicule, scoffing at times. And brethren, that's okay. That's the way it was already seen here, that these people were being spoken against everywhere. So what is the solution? Well, the solution is not to tone down the message. The solution is not to become embarrassed by the terms church of Christ. The, the, the solution is not to seek to become more camouflaged into what the world approves. But the solution is to take it from the Lord's lips himself there in John chapter 15. In verse 18, if the world hates you, you know. What should we know, Jesus? You know that it hated me before it hated you. And here's the logic of the Lord in verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. In other words, they're going to accept you. They're going to nurture you. They're going to uphold you. They're going to embrace you. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Because you are not of the world, because I chose you, plucked you out of the world, the world will hate you logically because before you it hated me. And I'm the one that took you out of the world. So we should expect some venom from the world. We should expect some hatred from the world. Woe to the people whom the world will praise. Woe to the people whom the world looks at and upholds. When Kelly and I were very young, we went into a place in Pennsylvania, Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, and we were inquiring where the church was because we knew there was a church there. A preacher that we knew mentioned that there's a church there. And so we were inquiring of the church, and we stopped in at this, uh, I don't know if it was a gas station or whatever. And we're like, because uh, it's a small town. Where's the Church of Christ? It goes, well, there's actually two of them. Uh, there's this one really small group here, but I don't advise you go to go to that one. Uh, don't go there. The one that you all would like, because we were really young at the time, as you can tell, I've changed. I'm not that anymore. So he'd probably direct me to the, the, the smaller one today if I went in there. But 
because we were young, he says, no, you want to go to this big church. It's, a, it's the happening place, basically. That's where you want to go. And so I want you to appreciate something that churches can camouflage themselves to where the world will embrace them, but Jesus will consider them lost. They, they will make him sick. Eventually, we'll look at the church that has a closed door. That's the church at Laodicea. And it literally made Jesus sick. I'm sure it was open to the world, but it was closed to Christ. He's standing on the outside knocking to come in. And so we must recognize the relationship that we have with the Lord as disciples of Christ will make our relationship to the world set at odds. And I need to see that. In fact, John puts it very succinctly here in 1 John chapter 3, 13. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. It's something that should not cause us to fall into dismay if we find that the world speaks ill over us. Okay? So what is it that we should pray for? I ask you first to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, here is a prayer. Notice what Paul says. Now, now let's preface Romans chapter 10 with Romans chapter 9, verse 2. And notice in Romans 9, 2 that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. The Apostle Paul is heavy-hearted over the condition of his own people. And so we read in chapter 10, brethren, verse 1, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. Okay, Moses is propped up here as speaking about the righteousness of the law of Moses. The one who does them shall keep them. Notice verse 6. Kind of another personality. The righteousness of faith speaks this way. How does it speak? Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. He says, do not say this. What's he talking about? The things that God will do, let him do. He alone can do them. We don't have to do super amazing things to be saved, God will send his own son down. We don't have to ascend and bring Messiah down, nor do we have to de descend and bring Messiah up. God will take care of that. What then is in our sphere? Notice verse 8. What does it say? And he's quoting from Deuteronomy. Ironically, he's quoting from the law to teach about, to teach about the justification, the righteousness of faith. And he says, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. God has given to us something that's near us. We don't have to do acrobats, acrobatic uh, uh, gymnastic you know, steps to, to, to find it. We don't have to take a ship to the moon to gain it. He has given it to us. It's very near to us. It's within our reach. We can read it, understand it, and obey it. And when we do that, we are justified by faith. It is the word of faith which we preach, Paul says. This is the gospel, the word of faith which we preach. Word of faith there is equivalent to the gospel that he begins in chapter 1, verse 16 of this letter. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how it was in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy. It was confess and believe. Now in verse 10, it is flipped to the way it's practically carried out. Verse 10, with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There is no distinction between Jew or Greek. 
For the same Lord over all is rich to all, all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice that Paul writes, my heart's desire and prayer. Verse 1. How effective is our evangelism without our heart's desire and without prayer? Not effective at all. It can't be. Paul's heart's desire was for Israel to be saved, for the lost to be saved, for those who are outside to be saved. His prayer was for them also to be saved. Without heart desire, our evangelism, individually or collectively, will be rendered ineffective. It can't be effective without the heart's desire. It can't do it. Now, having a heart that desires to please the Lord, having that heart-filled desire to obey the Lord, is something that will safeguard a person, an individual, and a collective body as well from, it'll safeguard us from, being too loose with our lips, speaking against Christ. It'll safeguard us from complaining. It'll safeguard us from gossip and slander. Notice, as you look at the example here of where one's heart was not in it, let's use Judas as an example of this and go to John chapter 12. The Gospel of John chapter 12. And what we have here in John chapter 12, if you start with verse 3, we have Mary, Martha's sister, Lazarus' sister, took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard. Notice what she does. She anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. This was a lavish gift where she is anointing the body of Jesus Christ. Notice how her posture and her demeanor is. Totally covered with humility. She washes his feet with her hair. And notice the fragrance that, it, that all in the house benefit from this. They all can smell this. Right? This should be considered a good thing. But, verse 4, one of his disciples, and not just one, this is one of the apostles, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Here is a man that is now discounting this gift, and notice 300 denarii, the common laborer's wage back then was one denarius, denarius per day. So this would be equivalent to almost a year's wage. That's the lavish uh, quality of the gift that Mary gave. So Judas is using this example to micro-scrutinize her to condemn her, to give her sacrifice to the dogs and calling it a waste. Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? It's basically a waste. This he said, notice where his heart's desire is not. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Here is a man who doesn't have any concern for the poor, using the poor to condemn Mary's gift. Okay? Jesus sees through the hypocrisy. And that's because his heart's desire was not to please the Lord, but it was to enrich Judas Iscariot. And he would take that eventually to the selling of Jesus himself, which resulted in his own untimely death of 
committing suicide because he was over distraught with guilt. It didn't benefit him. However, Mary is exonerated in this text. Jesus says in verse 7, let her alone. Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but for me you do not have with you always. So the parallel is those who are not concerned with the spiritual poor will sometimes become hypercritical as well as um, hypocritical (laughs) of those measures that are taken to retrieve the poor in spirit. Bible studies, a waste of time. That Bible study was a waste of time, they'll say. Got nothing out of it. Didn't learn anything from it. When we're actually looking at the eternal word of God here, or you know, the necessity of gospel meetings, a complete and utter waste of time. Or that preacher, you know, he was way too basic today. If he covers like a whole book at once, that's too basic. Complete and utter waste of time. Rather than seeing the jewels that are in covering that. Or if it's a, a sermon where we're going to spend the whole day in one verse, the whole sermon is going to be in one verse, we're going to pick it apart. Well, that was too technical. It was too detailed. And, and, and you know, why can't we do more? Why why did he limit it to just one verse? The Judas Iscariots don't see the value in the sacrifice. They don't see the value in the worship. Mary saw that. And it took criticism from others, but it did not change her persuasion of what she was going to do and what she did. In fact, on another account, Jesus said she will be preached alongside the gospel. Wherever the gospel is preached, Reference will be made to her, and we're making reference to her today here in North Ridgeville, Ohio, because of what she did on her own back then. And so the point is, without heart desire and without prayer, what is our prayer? We cannot be effective in reclaiming that which was lost. We can't. And so, you know, talking and in, in trying to reach the lost, my actions are going to be measured. My reactions are going to be bridled. I'm going to look for opportunities that will be inconvenient at times, but needful to try to sow seeds of the gospel in someone else's life. And so measures. I've got on the screen here Colossians. Notice in chapter 4, Paul says in verse 2, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. Do we pray fervently for open doors to speak the word of God. Next, as we think about our positioning with those who are lost, do we seek to think about how how we interact? Notice in verse 4, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Well, who are the outsiders? Who are those that are outside here? Those are those who are outside of Christ. These are non-converts. These are non-Christians. These are not disciples. And Paul says we need to walk in wisdom. When you read the word walk in these letters, it's talking about your general manner of life. That as we interact with non-Christians, we should interact with them in wisdom, which is taking the knowledge of the scriptures and applying it in the various given situations that we find ourselves with them. He says, redeeming the time. That's taking advantage of those opportunities. And then notice our speech. Let our speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. I need to be willing to think before I speak as I interact with them. They're going to say things that are just flat out wrong. They will believe things that are just flat out wrong. But I need to have grace in how I answer them so that I can bring them 
to the gracious Lord. When they were mocking Jesus under the cross and crucifying him, and we looked at his crucifixion scene this morning in the Lord's Supper, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That tells me that forgiveness of sins in that type of climate where all of this was happening to Jesus and literally he's, his veins are draining of life. And he makes that prayer of forgiveness. That tells me that forgiveness of sins trumps everything. That it is most important of anything that I find in life. The forgiveness of of sins. Hence, my heart's desire, Paul says, and prayer is for Israel that they may be saved. This is not speaking of Israel recoming back as a nation and having a kingdom on earth. All of that is the fantastic creations of the mind work of man. This is talking about having them saved spiritually with God. that They would obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I need to be impressed with those things. Jesus was ridiculed for spending time and eating with tax collectors and sinners. And he reminded them there in Mark chapter 2, oh, in verse 17, I think it is, it is not those who are sick that need a physician, but it, it is not those who are healthy that need a physician, but the sick. I have come not to call the righteous Right? But sinners unto repentance. The word call there is defined by fair and others as being inviting. Jesus was spending his time with these tax collectors to invite them to repentance. Now, let, let me tell you this. A church whose prayer is only about numbers is a prayer where the preacher and the pulpit will abort the message of repentance. Repentance is tied to conversion, but out there, people do not want to change. They do not want you to tell them this is right and this is wrong, but that's exactly what repentance will require of us. And because of that, the world will hate us, and we should recognize that ahead of time. You're too judgmental. You're self-righteous. Those are just some of the things that they will hurl at you. We must be willing to patiently embrace it taking the prayer of our Lord, at the same time taking the wisdom of our Lord and recognize that you can't cast pearls before swine and they will trample you under your feet. There may be a time later in life when they're more receptive to the word of God, but it may not be right now. And wisdom would dictate that. Well, a second prayer. Let's look at the scripture reading that Dave read for us this morning. Do we pray for the lost, but do we also pray for the saved? That's who Jesus is praying for here. He is praying for believers. He is praying for those who would come in to the body. These are those who are on the inside. I put up there on the inside. It necessarily applies or, or implies that if there is an outside, there's an inside. Walk with wisdom towards those who are outside that means there are also those who are inside. Do I pray for my brethren? Do I pray for the Lord's church? In John chapter 17, we see the, Im, the, the Im, implicit of the inside. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Notice, believe in me that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That's the inside. That the world may believe that you sent me. Notice verse 23, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. In one, may, being made perfect in that unity. There's an inside there where we should be praying for one another as well. Is our goal to have the unity with each other as the Son is unified with the Father? Is that our goal? You know, as we pray and we're talking about prayer, what is our prayer? We should verbally, as we pray to God, be reverent, right? We see Jesus doing that here in, in John chapter 17. In verse 25, O righteous Father, that's a pretty good way to approach God. Oh, righteous Father, right? 
But I want to address something that we don't frequently talk about when it comes to prayer. And that is our unworded prayers. You know, it's not only the things that we say that go up to God as we talk to him in prayer. And we have a great, tremendous blessing that we can go to the throne of grace and lay our cares at his feet. Such a tremendous blessing that is. But I want you to appreciate that our actions also serve as a prayer, in a sense. If you open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, and what we find in both the first and last books of the Old Testament is this idea of unworded prayers. Notice in Genesis chapter 4, I've got chapter 18 up there, but notice, do you remember Cain and Abel? And when Cain became enraged against Abel, he killed him. And notice chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 10, the language there of verse 10, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What, what uh, Cain had done was that he killed his brother. What's praying up to God? The effect of Cain's actions, the blood that was shed on the ground is crying up unto God. In Genesis chapter 18, 20 through 21, you have the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. And you might appreciate in verse 20 the parallelism, the great outcry and the great or grave sin. And God tells uh, the others there that he will go down and see. The word see there means to inspect carefully. And what that tells me is that God carefully looks at our actions and measures our actions before there's a judgment against our actions. I want you to appreciate, though, there in Genesis 18, as well as chapter 19, 12, and 13, that it was the, these actions that weren't necessarily formed in words to the Lord, but they cried up unto heaven as a prayer. Okay? Genesis teaches that. But Malachi does also. And hence, we have the law and the prophets teaching this, do we not? In the book of Malachi, you might appreciate, go to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. I'll advance this. There we go. Notice chapter 2. In chapter 2 of Malachi, in verse 13, here's what the scripture says. This is the second thing you do. What is the second thing you do? You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with good will from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? They're perplexed. Why would God not receive our offering? We're giving these animal sacrifices. God says, I'm not regarding your, your goodwill offerings because the altar is covered with tears. What does he mean by that? In verse 14, the Lord has been a witness, has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. These men, in the treachery that they were dishing out upon their wives, and the tears of their wives, were in essence canceling out all of the public worship that they were doing. Because the tears of the women, of the wives, were the prayers, in a sense, that came up to God, crying against their ungodly husbands. See that? We also can go down to verse 17 and notice our, our conversations one to another can become a prayer unto God, if you will. In verse 17, they shall, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis, uh, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words. These are their conversations. These are not wearying him with going to God in prayer, saying our Father in heaven. That's not what he's talking about here. 
He's talking about their daily conversations, their casual conversations where they misrepresent God. In whom, uh, in what way have we wearied him is what they're asking. Malachi the reasoner answers them, in that you say everyone who, set, who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? Where is the God of justice? When people cast uh, dispersing insults upon God, when they say God's out of control, where is the God of justice? How could God let this happen? When they do that, they're actually saying prayers against God, and he hears that as well. Now, we also have an example of a positive. Notice in chapter 3 and verse 16, we have another group of people here. And notice the relationship that these people have with their God, those who feared the Lord. Verse 16, chapter 3, Malachi, verse 16. Those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Now they're talking to one another. Here's a conversation. And we read that the Lord listened and heard them. Their conversations are also going up to heaven. No wonder Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, you'll be judged according to your words. God hears them. He remembers them. And so we read here of God listening in, if you will. The Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Notice the relationship that God has with them. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. These people who fear God are my jewels. That word there means treasure. What are we called in 1 Peter chapter 2? His special treasure. He's describing people that fear God, meditate on his name. And in our conversations that we have, whether it be here in a Bible study or whether it be in the privacy of our own, own homes as we're talking about God, those are also prayers unto him. So no wonder James tells us to you know, bridle our tongue, to guard our lips. The way we bridle our tongue, the really, the really real answer is if you treat it as a tongue issue, you're going to fail every time. The way the tongue is bridled is when the heart is bridled. That will be another lesson for another day. And so what is it that we pray for? What is our prayer? Fundamentally, we could only look at two, you know, in this morning's lesson, two prayers. We actually referenced in another Jesus' prayer on the cross, Lord, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But all of this follows into these two categories. Are we praying for those who are lost? Do we have a heart desire to reach out and save them? And are we praying for those who are saved? that they'll be grounded in the faith, that we can have the unity that exists between the Father and the Son. The Lord's desire is seen here, is it not, in the scripture reading? The world may believe that God sent Jesus, that the disciples would become perfected in one, that the world may know that God sent Jesus, not only that they would believe that God sent Jesus, but that they would know that God did send him and that the world may know that God loves his children even as he loves Jesus. That's something that you need to know as well. The world needs to know that God loves his children the way he loves the Son of God. You and I need to know that. He loves his children the way he loves the Son of God. That relationship is in play for you and me. We are called joint heirs with Jesus in Romans chapter 8. And in Galatians chapter 3, we are told how we can become children of God. We are children of God by faith, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. And that, that is manifested in our response to the word of faith. 
We don't have to ascend into the heavens and bring the Christ down. We don't have to descend into the earth and bring the Christ up. What we need to do is believe, and we need to confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and we need to call on the name of the Lord. How do we call on the name of the Lord? Nick mentioned this in his invitation on Wednesday night. And so it is, as we call on the name of the Lord, it brings us to the burial of an old man of sin who's corrupt, laying that old man of sin down into what we often frequently refer to as a watery grave, so that we can rise up, resurrect into newness of life. No wonder that the Apostle Paul in Galatians 3, 27, 26 and 27, for you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, that's inside, have put on Christ. You've clothed yourself with Christ. No wonder God will love you the way he loves his own son. Are you a Christian today? If you're not, think of what you're forfeiting. You are not in that special perfected love that God has. Render yourself obedient. Let the Lord come and make his home with you. Be like those in John chapter 14, 21. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Render yourself obedient to the gospel today. If you've got sin in your life or if you need prayer, the prayers of the saints, let us pray for you today as together we stand and as we sing this song.